Yes. All right, everyone, we are going to go ahead and get started on our second uh, Zoom session of the morning. And as Melody just said in the chat box, you're in for a treat uh, today. So um, I'm Audrey Harmon. I'm a state ag in the classroom coordinator. We are glad that you've joined us. Shelly Mitchell is an a horticulture youth specialist at Oklahoma State University. And she always does a great job. She's one of the favorite presenters for the teachers every year. And we're so glad she was able to join us. I'm gonna let um, Melody and Emily introduce themselves and then we're gonna get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Agu. I'm one of the Ag in the Classroom coordinators. Uh, welcome to our second session of the morning. It is going to be an awesome one. Uh, we just want to, uh, we're glad we're, everyone's here. Um, kind of my role for the day is I'll be working with the Q&A. So if you do have any questions for Shelly, for our presenter, then please put those questions in the Q&A. Uh, we can see them and they don't get lost as easy as when you put them in the chat box. So um, just let us know if you have any questions. I'm sure she would appreciate them. And I'm Melody Ockfield. As Emily said, welcome. And we're so glad that you joined us. And my role is the chat uh, function today, and I'll be uh, monitoring that. I might ask you some questions. I try to get you to interact with the other participants, um, but also I'll be answering any questions about Ag in the Classroom that you have there. Um, but the other role that I have is probably to get Shelly to sing today. So anyway, we'll see how. Ah, huh, I got she's, that covered with you she's two. She's got it covered. Oh, all right, great. So, <laughs> uh, welcome everyone and uh, we will get started. Thanks so much. And one more person of our team that we want to let you know about. We um, just this week found out that we have a new team member. So we're so excited. Uh, we have a new part-time curriculum coordinator. Uh, Susan Murray, and she's joining us on the call today. So um, if you want to give her a shout out in the chat box, I'm sure she'd love that. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to let Shelly get started because she's got lots of great information to share. Thanks, Shelly. Okay. Is it mine now? Okay. It's yours. Okay, cool. Um, so like they said, my name is Shelly Mitchell and I am the youth specialist for the horticulture department. And I, this is about my 12th year doing that. Before that, I spent nine years teaching high school science in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And when I was teaching biology, I was getting questions from kids that were leading me to understand that they did not know anything about where their food comes from. And some of them could not even identify food. Uh, I had one kid walk up with an orange and ask me what it was. And this is a 15 year old who's lived in America their whole life. And I was like, that's an orange. And they were like, I've never seen one like this before. And, and it turns out she'd only ever seen one that had been peeled and pulled apart. So they can't even necessarily recognize food and they don't know where it comes from. I had a, um, a piece of a cotton plant on my desk and kids started asking me why I glued cotton balls to a stick. So at that point I started incorporating more ag into my lessons. So I taught biology using an ag theme and I started using ag in the classroom lessons, even though at that time they only went to about sixth grade, I started using them with high school students. And then I got more and more into the ag in the classroom, ag uh, leaning biology. And then um, horticulture asked me if I'd be a youth specialist. So I come from a background of nine years teaching high school science and now I'm doing ag related lessons all the time. So a lot of people want to incorporate plants and horticulture into their classrooms and a bunch of people as I've gone across the state have the same few obstacles. They say they have no time to teach uh, gardening or horticulture because they have all these other lessons they have to use and they don't have time to plan more. They say they don't have space for a garden. Some people think you have 10 acres and a tractor and all you really need is a windowsill or a light bulb. They say they have no money, which I'm used to having a zero dollar budget. So I'm all about that. And then they say they have no uh, experience. So my job is to go around and help eliminate all those uh, obstacles. And so I'm willing to come around the state. Part of my job is to go around the state and teach teachers how to use plants in their curriculum or how to start or 
restart having a school garden. And I show them how it, um, how you can incorporate teaching plants into any subject. So instead of adding it as another unit, you're just infiltrating basically. So we talk about how you can use uh, math in the garden, how you can use art in the garden, and PE and English and all that stuff. So one of the things we're gonna do today is I decided to focus on hamburger plants, which there's two lessons I'm drawing for from Ag in the Classroom. One is the build a giant cheeseburger and one is build a burger. So I made this on one of those Ag in the Classroom tours across Oklahoma. My year we did Northwest Oklahoma. So when we first got to the uh, extension office before the trip started, they had sewing machines and we were all making these huge burgers. All right. And so we have the bun and we have, we have tomatoes. And they were made out of felt and we have and we have pickles and we have mayonnaise stuff like that and so anyway what we're going to do is we're going to build a burger that's not this big but we're going to talk about all the ingredients what plant they come from what part of the plant they come from and uh, then you can expand from there depending on the ages of your kids so the first thing we're going to talk about because when we talk about where your food comes from, even if they know it comes from a plant, there's six main parts of a plant, all right? So these are the six main parts of a plant. You've got the roots, you've got the stems, you've got the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, and the seeds. And so we actually videotaped for Oklahoma Gardening a song that teaches you all the different parts of the plant and what they do. So since everybody was wanting me to sing it last time, I found the YouTube version and we're going to watch that for, it'll just take a couple minutes and you'll see the whole like full body workout that goes along with that. So I'm going to show that real quick. Shelly's turned that off. I just wanted to make sure everyone noticed in the chat box, Melody uh, posted the link to the video. And so you'll be able to use it uh, in your classroom. That's a great video. And 
if it wasn't going through Zoom and trying to buffer, uh, it would work great. So I know your students will love it. Oh, we're going to give you guys a quiz and see if you can Ugh, try to figure all this out. <laughs> okay, is it good now? Okay, okay, good. All right, so that is what we do. I actually have the kids stand up, and depending on how hyper the kids are, we might do it 10 times. All right, and that's just on YouTube. If you go to the Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel and you put my name after Oklahoma Gardening when you search, it'll bring up all kinds of little lessons and ideas and activities that you can do in a classroom with kids. Also, I've sent Audrey a list. I have like a big handout on day camp activities, which you can use in the classroom as well. And I have a big list of resources, most of which are free or very cheap. So Audrey can send those links out. And then my contact information you can use to reach me and I drive across the state doing uh, teacher training. So if you have a professional development day or, you know, if it's the further away from Stillwater you get, the more people I'd like to have. So I'm not just driving across the state for, you know, two people. It's easily, more easily able to uh, justify if I'm going down like to Durant for like 50 people whatever. So that's, that's one thing that I can do. All right, so today we're going to take those parts of the plant and we're going to learn about hamburgers and how all parts of a hamburger trace back to plants. Or if you know about photosynthesis, all parts of the hamburger really trace back to the sun. All right, so there's two different activities I do with this. One involves drawing on a piece of paper and one involves making it with felt. So we're basically gonna make this, all right? And usually I have them make it like on a half size sheet of poster board, but today we're gonna make it on eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. So the first thing you wanna do, we're gonna make an exploded version of a hamburger here. So at the top, you're gonna draw a big, cucumber shape and you're going to fill it in with brown. All right. And then we talk about what is a bun? What is a bun made of? And so buns are made of flour, a bunch of kids will say. And my 10th graders, I asked them where flour came from and they said, flower plant? <laughs> I'm not even kidding. All right. So you explain, yeah, it comes from flour. What is flour made of? And then you can talk about wheat. You can talk about other cereal grains if you wanted to. But they color it in wheat. Okay, so how does wheat grow? And it grows in the field. All right, and how do they harvest it? You can talk about that. And what part of the plant are you eating? Of the six parts, what do you think you're eating? The roots, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, or the seeds? And it's the seed. All right, so then you would make a little you would write that they were, the wheat comes from a plant, which is, you know, wheat comes from seeds which is a plant. And then if you want to, they can make little sesame seeds on there. And those are also from plants. And depending on how old the kids are and what subject you're teaching, you could talk about how, you know, sesame seeds aren't from plants we normally grow around here, where they originate from. And they pull up a part of the plant, pull up a picture of the plant and talk about how they, they come from Asia and, you know, the major, suppliers of it around the world are from Asia, I think like India or something. And you could have a world map and you could point to those uh, countries and how would it get here? And you could talk about, you know, immigration and emigration and you talk about, you know, global trade. So it just depends on what you're teaching as to where you could take that. All right. Yeah, I know we process sesame in Oklahoma, but it's not like the, it's not like the original source. All right. So now we're going to draw a piece of cheese, all right, and we talk about where does cheese come from. Okay, cheese is made from milk, and milk comes from a cow, all right, and what do cows eat? Plants, all right, like grasses and stuff. So even though cheese comes from milk, which comes from a cow, it still comes from plants because that's what cows eat to make the milk. So then we draw, we label next to it, we say that the cheese came from a cow and a cow eats plants, all right? And while we're doing this, we're also cutting things out of felt if we're going that route. So when we have, when we're making it out of felt, here's our bun, all right? It's just two pieces of tan felt 
And sometimes I give them Sharpies and they make little sesame seeds with Sharpies tip. And then for the cheese, use a couple of pieces of cheese that we put on in the burger there. Okay, the next thing. You can do it whatever order you want. This is just the order I go. All right, the next one is, what's this? It's a tomato. All right, so a tomato is what part of the plant? All right, well, it's fruit, all right, and legally it's regarded as a vegetable. And this actually always went, actually went to the Supreme Court because the tomato people, there was a fruit tax and the tomato people, were, no, let's see, no, it was a vegetable tax. So it was a vegetable tax and the tomato payers, tomato growers didn't want to pay the, the tax, the exports on the uh, import tax on the uh, tomatoes. So they said, well, we're really a fruit. And so we shouldn't have to pay the vegetable tax. And the government's like, <clears throat> really? And so they went and they didn't have like a legal definition at that point. So they literally pulled people in off the street in the Supreme Court and were asking them, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? And most people think vegetables are not sweet. So they were like, well, the tomato is obviously a vegetable. So it's been deemed a officially a vegetable, uh, legally speaking, but in reality it's a fruit. And, you know, they grow on bushes or vines and you could, you could get a fresh one and you could talk about how they come in different colors. It's like, there's heirloom varieties, you know, and why is it good to have biodiversity? Talk about the different colors. Some come in chocolate color, some come in, you know, yellow color, some come in red color. And what are those colors? What are those phytonutrients? What do they represent? What do you eat? And what kind of vitamins do you get for different colors? And why is it important to eat a varied diet? Yada, yada, yada. So you can take it as far as you want, depending on your age and your subject. So. When we're in tomatoes, we cut little red circles and sometimes people cut out little areas where the seeds would be, which is how you know the tomatoes are fruit. It's so much easier. <laughs> All right, so there's a tomato and you, and you say it's a plant because it is. All right, the next one. All right, and I am not an art teacher, but that is a piece of lettuce. All right, get ahead of me there. It's not a pickle yet. <laughs> this is lettuce. All right, so what is what is lettuce? Is that a plant or an animal or what? All right, well, it's a plant, right? And so, uh, so you say, you know, we have leaf lettuce and we have head lettuce. Now, a lot of kids don't have much of a variety in their diet. There was a study done not too long ago where it showed that most Americans only ate from like eight different, eight different plant groups. I mean, the plant groups, eight different kinds of plants, mainly iceberg lettuce, right? Uh, tomatoes, but only in the form of ketchup, apples in the form of applesauce, carrots, um, potatoes in the form of french fries, stuff like that. So kids, kids do not have much of a variety of exposure to different fruits and veggies and their taste buds are all geared for like salt and sugar. So when we talk about things like different color tomatoes, um, different kinds of lettuce, a lot of times I'll bring in different kinds of fruits and vegetables. I won't tell them what it is. Of course, first I figure out if there's allergies or anything, but I bring like little like dice sized pieces of things. I don't let them see what it is, but I'll top up like jicamas and kiwi and strawberries and I'll get carrots that are purple instead of orange. So I'll try to fill for a loop and I won't tell them what it is until they've gone through a tasting. Because if you try to hand a kid a new food, they're like, I don't like it. It's like, yeah, I haven't even tried it, right? Okay, so to make sure if they really do like it or really do hate it, what I do is I give them, and I sent this to Audrey, I give them a taste test uh, sheet and it has the five senses and it has A through F. And so before we do anything with it, we just look at it, look at that little chunk of whatever it is on our, um, a little chunk on our plates. And the first thing we rate it is sight. So just look at it. We're not eating it, we're not smelling it, just look at it and give it a grade A through F. 
So, you know, you might end up hating peppers, but you might like the color, you know, and I give them a variety of colors. So when we're, when we're looking at the, when we're grading it, I'm like, we're grading the purple thing, we're grading the yellow thing, whatever. And after they grade it on site, we all pick it up. This is all at the same time. We all smell it and give it a grade. And then as they put it in their mouth and they, and they bite down, they give it a grade on how it sounds and how it feels in their mouth. Is it like squishy or crunchy and do they like that? And then the very last thing they grade is taste. So after they've all graded all those five senses for each piece of food, then I say, hey, you know, this purple thing. And the kids are like, it tasted like a carrot, but it didn't look like a carrot. And it's like, well, you know, it is carrot. And carrots naturally come in a wide rainbow of colors. But the reason you're used to seeing orange, because back in the day, Holland had a leader, and it was like orange, it's like the orange area of Holland. So like he was like the Duke of Orange or something. And uh, so that was their color, was orange. And they were harvesting carrots one day, and up comes an orange one, because they naturally come a lot of colors. Well, after they discovered an orange carrot, that's all they grew after that. And since they were the major provider of carrots, back then, everyone thought eventually that all carrots were orange, but really that's just one color. So I try to give them colors that are different, to kind of throw them for a loop. But most of the stuff I do, a lot of the kids haven't had like blueberries, cranberries, all those things a lot of kids have never had. And I really like it on Thanksgiving when I go do presentations and I get some fresh cranberries. <laughs> and that's one of the things they taste. And they're like, they don't expect it to be so sour. And so then we explain how, you know, cranberry sauce must have a lot of what, so it tastes sweet. And they're like, sugar. And I'm like, so now you've got fresh cranberries, you can explain why cranberry sauce really shouldn't be sweet and why it is. And I just know they go home the next day at Thanksgiving and remember that. So that's just kind of a cheap thrill of mine. I like, I like messing with kids. All right. So if you're in the felt version, we cut out a piece of felt, some light green felt. That's the lettuce. All right. And then on this, on this thing, we say, you know, it's a plant that grows on top of the ground. It can be a head lettuce, a leaf lettuce. And lettuce is something easy to grow even inside if you have a light. Um, like a shoebox, you plant some lettuce seed, you got to light, harvest it as it grows. It's really easy to do. All right, I'm doing too many things. What's next? All right. Next thing we color in is the beef patty. All right. So now if you're, if you're, if you have an um, ethnic group that doesn't eat meat, it could be a soybean patty. So this, whatever, whatever your audience is. All right. So we give them dark felt and they take charities and they can make sizzle marks if they want. And we talk about if it's a soybean patty, um, where do soybeans grow? We, we do grow soybeans in Oklahoma and they grow in little pods on a little bush looking plants. You talk about that. If it's from a steer, it's a uh, beef. And so what do steers eat? They eat plants. So here we go again. We're eating a part of a steer, but it's originally from plants, which are originally get their energy from the sun. All right. So we talk about, we label that one. So it's got beef, cattle, plants. All right, the next one is one of my favorites. Okay, onions. Now, there's different colors of onions. And usually you don't put all of them on your hamburger at the same time, but I like to reiterate that they're not just white onions. All right, there's all kinds of onions. And so there's purple ones and yellow ones and white ones, and sometimes people eat some for certain some in certain places and some in others. Like a lot of people like purple or white onions on their burgers. And some people like yellow onions on other things. So it's a personal taste preference and they grow underground. So they are a root. And I like doing the onions because I take little pie planers, just a half of a pie planer, and we make them into little rings. So then you have a purple, a yellow, and a white onions, all right? And so here you talk about onions and how they are plants, how they are roots, all right? And if you, if you were talking, if you were a science teacher, you could say, you know, how many of you cry when you cut onions? 
that's because there's a lot of sulfur in onions. And when that sulfur fume gets up in your eyeball where there's water, it basically makes weak sulfuric acid. So that's why it stings so bad, right? And if you were teaching like food science, you'd go over the, um, you know, some people put an onion in the freezer for like 10 minutes before they cut it. Does that help? You could try wearing goggles. Does that help? So you could experiment with like, how could you cut onions without crying and without your eyes stinging? So that's like a little side experiment you could do. All right, now, now we're at the pickles. All right, this is one of my favorites too. So we cut out a couple little green uh, felt circles for the pickles. And a lot of kids think that cucumbers come from pickles. They don't understand it's the reverse. Right, and so what is a pickle? It's a fruit because it's got seeds inside. If the kids didn't believe you, you could take a cucumber and cut it open. That's easy enough to prove. And um, uh, I'm sorry, the chat's like distracting me. <laughs> uh, the pickles grow on a vine or a bush, and those take a long time to grow. So some of these things aren't something you really grow during the school year and outside the garden so much, but Anyway, you could bring in different kinds of pickle, pick, uh, cucumbers and you could actually have somebody show you how to pickle them. You could talk about the different kinds of pickles, bread and butter pickles. And if you're talking about like, history or social studies, you could talk about like how did dill pickles come to be and how did bread and butter pickles come to be and, you know, all that. So it depends on what you're teaching. You can take it different places. So here's that one, the pickles, the cucumbers and their plants and their fruits. All right, so we've already had tomatoes. So what is this? Yes, it's ketchup. <laughs> All right, what's ketchup mainly made of? Corn, from corn syrup. All right, that's what most ketchups mostly are made of. That's why kids like it so much. And actually, there's an interesting story. If you want to read the book called The World History of Salt, which is a huge book, but it's actually extremely interesting. And if you teach social studies or science, you really should read that. It's really cool. They even have recipes and stuff. But ketchup, originally, you know, they didn't have much to preserve food. And so a lot of their meats and foods tasted pretty bad. So they wanted to put something on their foods that it would make the food palatable. So they put ketchup on. Well, ketchup back then was made from the world history of salt. The um, ketchup was made from anchovies that were like thrown in a brine solution and compressed and, and preserved. And then we'd chop it all off up and spread on meat and stuff. So yay, ketchup. Yeah, the world history of salt. Um, Anyway, after a while, people were like really getting sick of anchovy ketchup, you know? And so they start making out of like wild mushrooms and garlic and stuff. But by the time the idea of ketchup got over to America, I guess their taste buds had changed and they started making it out of tomatoes. All right, this, this is where it gets interesting. The Philippines, they love ketchup made out of tomatoes from America, all right? Well, the World War, one or two, I can't remember. One of the World Wars made where they couldn't get potatoes into the Philippines to make ketchup. They didn't have very many tomatoes on their own, but they had a lot of bananas. So they actually took a lot of bananas, smushed them up, dyed it red, put it in a ketchup bottle, and it's called banana sauce. And if you go to Walmart, to the Asian aisle, for like less than a dollar, you can get a good old fashioned looking glass bottle of banana sauce ketchup. And let the kids try that because that is actually fun to mess with and it's history thing. So there you go, you're teaching social studies, history, immigration, global trade. How did things change over time? Well, we went from anchovies to bananas in some places. So it's just a really fascinating story. I'm sorry I get I go down rabbit holes all the time. Anyway, so this is tomato ketchup comes from corn, which is a all those little kernels are seeds. All right, so when you're pulling the little silk, and you should do this, get, get an unopened thing of corn. All those little silks, all right, originally had little flowers, and those silks all go to one to each kernel, all right? That's how, that's how the pollen got all the way down and fertilized each kernel. So 
you peel all those off and you have all these seeds. All right. So each one of those seeds had a separate, started out as a separate little flower. And then the, um, of course, the tomatoes, we already covered them. They grow on a vine and they're fruit. All right. So what's this? If we just had ketchup, now we have mustard. All right. And those mustard seeds are really, really tiny. All right. And so for that one, oh, sorry, here was my ketchup. And now I'm having, here's my mustard. All right. So mustard seeds come from a little mustard plant. It's about the size of a sesame seed plant. All right. And I think they came from Asia or Africa. I can't remember which right off the top of my head. But you could talk about, look up where they came from. But mustard is a plant and mustard seeds get crushed in there with vinegar and stuff to make mustard. And you could have a mustard taste test. You know, bring in some different kinds of mustard, bring in pure tomato ketchup, conventional corn syrup, ketchup, and then banana sauce. Just have a taste test of common. I mean, that sounds like it would be fun. All right. Mayonnaise. All right. So what is mayonnaise made of? Here's my mayonnaise. It's made out of eggs and vegetable oil. Okay, so the vegetable oil, that comes from vegetables, different vegetables, depending on, you know, what's cheapest, I guess. And then um, the eggs come from what? Chickens. And what do chickens eat? Well, sometimes they eat grains and sometimes they eat bugs. And what do the bugs eat? Either other bugs or plants. And eventually you get down to where plants are the base of the food chain. And so that's where you have your mayo. So the mayo is, we kind of have a lot going on with the mayo. So it depends on what, how far you want to take it. All right. And then at the end of it all, you put the other bun on. So then you have an exploded version of a hamburger. All right. Now when I'm doing this with kids, like in camps and in schools and stuff. We're doing this on a big piece of paper. All right, so here's the hamburger part, and we talk about each part. And then on the other side, we have, at the bottom, we have six parts of plants, and we list them all, and we do, we sing the song, those music notes remind me that to sing the song. And then at the top, we have what plants need to grow. And I don't want you to see that yet. All right, so what plants need to grow, you take the word plants and you write it down vertically. And by the P and the L and the A and the N and the T and the S, you write down what plants need to grow. Now the cool thing is the plants acronym represents everything a plant, plant needs to grow. So you have, them, you have them guess, what is, like somebody here chat, what is one thing that plants need to grow? Okay, photosynthesis. Okay, they, they perform photosynthesis, but what are they using? What do they need so that they can perform photosynthesis? Sun, okay. So sun is actually represented by L in the plant word, L for light. So light comes from the sun and then the plants take in CO2 and they take in the sun and they take in water and what do they make at the end of photosynthesis? They give off oxygen and they make sugar for themselves. All right, so that's the L, the light. Um, anyone want to guess what the A stands for? All right, everyone, she's waiting on you to answer in the chat box. Don't keep her waiting forever. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> air, okay, it stands for air. So, because sometimes plants are breathing in CO2 to do photosynthesis, but just like every other living thing, when the plant is actively growing or when it's actively, you know, growing, maintaining itself, producing a flower, whenever it's using energy, the way that it uses energy is the same way we do. And it's the opposite of photosynthesis, and that's respiration. So we breathe in oxygen, and we eat sugar, and we're able to grow and live and do our things. And so when the plant's growing and doing things, it's also using sugar. So it takes the sugar it made through photosynthesis and takes in oxygen like we do. And then 
it, we, they end up breathing out CO2. Some parts of them are taking in CO2 and some parts of them are releasing CO2, but overall they give off more oxygen than they take. So yay for us, because we need oxygen. So you could talk about how we support them and they support us and yay, yay. Um, and it's for nutrients. So if you're teaching math, you could talk about, you get a bag of fertilizer, it's got three numbers on them. Okay, those numbers represent percentages of the ingredients that provide the nitrogen, phosphorus, and the potassium in that order. And they're, they're, they're not just pure potassium and pure um, phosphorus and stuff. They're actually like potash and stuff like that. But you could do, like, it's not always 10, 10, 10. You go to your fertilizer, it might be 30, 0, 0. It might be 0, 10, 50, all right? And that just shows the percentage of which elements are in there. And if you're teaching like science and math, you're teaching an up level grade, you could actually go do a soil test, take the soil test. You can, you can find out how to do that online on the extension fact sheets or at your county extension office. They can show you how to do a soil test. You turn it in, when you get it back and you tell them what it is you wanna grow, whether it's vegetables, grass, whatever, they'll say, these are the nutrients you have in your soil. This is what you need to add. So if you need to add a lot of nitrogen, but nothing else, you would get a bag that's like 30, 0, 0, all right? Or if you only needed to add phosphorus, you would get like 0, whatever, 0. So you can get different ratios of those um, nutrients. So that would be a way for the kids to find out, oh, this is what a soil test is. This is what it shows us. This is what all these numbers mean in fertilizer bags. So, you know, there's some math and higher level thinking in there. Okay, so we did the light, the nutrients, and the air. Okay, so what does P stand for? All right, it stands for place. So do all plants grow in the shade? Do they grow as well as they would in the sun? Do they even grow at all? Some plants need sun, some plants need shade, some plants need a little bit of both. Some plants um, can go in cooler areas, some plants want to be in warmer areas. So depending on what kind of plant it is, where it needs to be placed. If you take a full shade plant, put it in the sun, it's probably gonna die a miserable death, all right? So place is important. Um, S, you could say soil or you could say substrate because there's hydroponics and not all plants need soil to grow in. For plants, the soil gives their roots a place to stay and it also brings in, that's where the nutrients and the water come from. With hydroponics, you don't need soil. You can provide the nutrients and water to the roots. The main thing with hydroponics though is the reason they're able to put their roots in straight water and not drown is because in every sense of hydroponics, you've got aeration coming. So you have an air stone from an aquarium or something, but there's air in the water. So they're not like the roots aren't like drowning. All right, and then the last one is T, which I got it in there, kind of, kind of quirky, but the T stands for thirsty because all plants need water, just like all the living things need water. So plants list out all the different things a plant needs to grow. You got the six parts of the plant. They've now been illustrated by a hamburger, the parts of the plant and where how everything goes back to the plants. Uh, there's so many ways I can go from here. Does anybody have any questions in general? Oh, before I forget, you follow the Oklahoma School Garden Network Facebook page. I upload videos, I upload lessons, I upload grants and trainings that I find out about. I upload videos like, hey, look, here's a two, a two minute video on how they harvest celery. So there's stuff in there that you can show the kids. There's stuff that are uh, background materials on interesting things to teach kids. And then whenever I do trainings, which is usually a couple times a year, I, um, I, I upload the notice on that too. So if you join that, there's, and I also have my um, handouts permanently linked on there. So if you go there, you'll get the new stuff as it comes out. It'll be in the loop when I find information on grants and stuff like that and trainings. I'm also the state coordinator for the Junior Master Gardener program, which is a 4-H program, but 
you don't have to use, if you don't have to do it in a 4-H group or anything. They have a really good curriculum that's really basic. And I like it because all their lessons use things like paper plates and newspapers and markers and things that, you know, old ties, stuff you don't need to go, go buy a kit and then buy, you know, the stuff that needs to be replenished in the kit. We're talking like straws and tissue paper and stuff. So that's why I like them. And that's on my list of lengths. Um, so yeah, if you need me to help brainstorm lesson ideas, or if you want me to come look at your school yard and see what we could do with it, the first thing you would do is call your local extension office and ask them if they could help, because that's, they're the local version of me. And then if they want uh, additional help or additional ideas, then they'll contact me. Or you can contact me directly, but I'll probably put your local extension office in the loop because they don't like to be left out. They don't want someone coming in and doing something and then other people are like, oh, OSU came. And the extension people are like, what? We are OSU, what's going on? They don't want their territory, you know, just stomped into. So make sure you keep them in the loop. And if you don't even know what extension is, that'd be a good thing to learn about right now because your tax dollars pay for all kinds of information in food science and child and, you know, family living and consumer science, ag, cattle, soybeans, gardening, all that stuff. If you go to OSU uh, webpage and you type in extension fact sheets, there's like all kinds of how to it for like gardening, childcare, planning your will, all kinds of good stuff. It's all paid for by tax dollars. It's all free to download. So if you're not aware of that resource, you might want to go look at that. Does anybody have any general questions? Shelly, thanks. You've done a great job. Does anyone have any questions for Shelly? Either um, more clarification about extension, um, what she, other programs that maybe she's done with students. Um, they're wanting your contact information. So, uh, Shelly, right? yeah, and we'll put it in the chat. Shelly.mitchell at okstate.edu. Sure okay okay yeah, don't forget to put that second E in my name. We'll add it right now. Anyone else have any questions? Shelly, I have to tell you, I keep track of our participants and you have nine people who watched you last week and they came back to watch you again this week. That is impressive to me. So that means you, you did a great them. Did I leave job. Anything? Did I leave them anything, <laughs> anything out from last time? What, am I, what did I not go over that I did last time? What am I missing? Anyone remember something that she needs to add in? Shelly, do you want to tell them, I know this summer you didn't get to have your summer camps, but do you want to tell them about your uh, summer camps so that they can let students know about those opportunities or anything um, additional that, that maybe you do? Yeah, so when I taught high school, um, you know, not every kid goes to college and not every kid Want to or need to, but a lot of kids want to, but nobody has gone and they don't know if it's like a fit or if they would if it would work for them. And so the state regions of Oklahoma have um, have, a, have a summer academy uh, program where kids from seventh grade to tw so the the summer before your seventh grade year to the summer before your senior year, if you're in that age group. They have residential and commuter camps at colleges all across Oklahoma, the, the colleges and universities write a grant. And so my camp is for upcoming ninth and 10th graders. It's called Camp Turf, and it's all about horticulture careers. So my kids come live at the OSU campus for two weeks. All day, every day, we're doing hands-on activities like building terrariums and making bonsai and filming a segment for Oklahoma Gardening and uh, touring the bug zoo and going to the botanic gardens. It's all like horticulture stuff. And I take 25 kids. It's completely free to them. All room board. All you have to do is get yourself there and home. Other than that, everything is covered. It's totally free. That's why I write the grant. It's about 1500 a kid, but I write the grant to pay for it. And so anybody, doesn't matter if it's private, homeschool, public school, any kid in Oklahoma who is going into ninth or 10th grade can apply to that. And with all the state summer academies, they send out a big, they send out a, 
a poster and a link to every secondary science and math teacher in the state and every school counselor in the state. So if you're middle school, junior high or high school, you should already begin this information and you go to their central website and it lists all the camps and when they are and who they're for and what the topic is. So mine's called Camp Turf and that's uh, 10 years now. This would have been our 11th summer, but you know, stuff. Other than that, I have week long day camps for like eight to 12 year olds, but those are more in the Payne County area because those are just day camps for kids. And then I do scout workshops and I do teacher trainings and I do master gardener trainings and I go to um, like institutions with the people with developmental disabilities live at and we do hands on activities there. I pretty much do everything I can to get people excited about plants. Shelly, we did have one question come in. What are some good fall vegetables to grow in an outside school garden? Okay, so if you go to those fact sheets that I talked about, you go to OSU website and then you go to extension fact sheets, there is a guide on fall gardening in Oklahoma. And um, it actually lists like, what's good to plant, when's a good time frame to plant it in, and uh, our last, our first frost is usually October, although lately it's been like the first November. But basically, if it says you can start it, and you start, you've got like it takes 60 days to grow or whatever, and you've got 60 days before the frost, you can make it happen. Um, a lot of things like tomatoes, they're really good in the spring, and then they just look horrible in the summer because they don't take the heat, and uh, they have to have days that are like 80 degrees or less to actually like put little flowers on to get pollinated. So as it starts getting towards the fall, they actually have another, so you can grow tomatoes in the fall. And uh, I forget how long it would take though, but like things like lettuce and radishes, carrots, you can grow those right now. Radishes only take like three weeks. I've done them inside in a shoebox. So there's plenty of things you can grow, like a little leaf lettuce. Those are fast and easy. Probably herbs like basil. I've never had a problem with basil and I don't have very much of a green thumb contrary to popular belief, but basil is real easy. So I would say herbs for sure. You don't have time for things like gourds and pumpkins because they take like all summer, but uh, there's a lot of things you can plant, but mainly look at that fall garden guide. And then since, our, since Oklahoma is in two different like, heat zones, Ask your local extension agent what is best to plant because you know, they live right there. Thank, thanks, Shelly. And we put the link, um, I think Melody put the link in the chat box, or Emily, one of them, put the link in the chat box for everyone. I'm going to share my screen for just a second. We have a, a garden reader um, that you can request for your students. So this is one of our new student resources. It would go along great with uh, what Shelly's talked about today. Um, you can go on our website under student readers and request this. So it's perfect for elementary. Let me zoom out just a little bit so you can see as the life cycle. So as you're going through um, the plant parts as Shelly's uh, discussed them, you can do that. Also, what do plants need? to grow and then on um, the back of it, it has some math questions, um, working on the perimeter and things of that nature. So this is one of our new resources that you could request for your students and you go on our website to do that. Um, and you just would go under classroom resources. There's lots of other resources that we have on there that you can request and we can send to you for free. We have bookmarks with fun facts that would go along um, with any of the agriculture topics. There is even one for sesame. So uh, that's something, let me, I can share that real quick too. I'll show you what those look like. Let me go back to my um, screen sharing. And that's not what I wanted to share. One second. Um, that's under a good one. Bookmarks. Yeah, that is a good one. And it's pretty much only available in um, on the internet right now. We have a few copies left. So if you get on, you can request one of those fruits, nuts, and veggies, and we'll send it out while we have it. Here's the sesame bookmark. So if you've not ever seen sesame growing, here's what it looks like. And then some fun facts on the back. But as you look through the bookmarks, these are the front and the back. They're on the website, so you can pull them up on your boards for your students to see. But you can also request a set of these. There's 25 different bookmarks, and we would be glad to send them to you. 
So just go on our website, request those, look through the other resources. We've got so many great resources that we can get into your hands for free. Um, so you can use them with your students. And also if you have to do the distance learning, you can share those links out and have them, have them doing the activities uh, with you that way. So Shelly, thanks so much. Two great workshops last week and this week. We appreciate you and everything that you do. And I don't see any more questions coming in. So we're going to go ahead and close this session out. And uh, please join us for our next one. Thanks, okay, Shelly. Thanks.